Okay, so, we're approaching a year of making these videos. Oh shit, we are. And you've only covered games you like, right? Yeah. So we should maybe broaden our horizons. If you make me play a game with tank controls that isn't Resident Evil 4 God Hand, I am going to kill you. I was thinking along the lines of JRPGs. Oh no, that's worse. Just start with one you actually like. Final Fantasy XII is my favorite JRPG of all time. This should come across as especially surprising for a game in a series which originated a lot of the issues I have with JRPGs way back on the NES and then continued to uphold them. However, starting with Final Fantasy XI, the series started to change, maybe for better or worse in the eyes of fans. But regardless of your opinion, you can now play all of the mainline Final Fantasy games on PC on Steam. So let's go to the Final Fantasy XII store page and... Oh. $50 for a graphically upgraded version of a PS2 game. Zodiac Age is a fine port of the game technically, and while the art style strays a bit from the original, it looks pretty good. The audio has also all been completely remastered, and it also sounds very good. Zodiac Age also somewhat changes the class system, allowing you to have two classes after you unlock the summon Belial. However, this is really the most notable change between the more original Final Fantasy XII and Zodiac Age. The game is also straight up not made for characters to have two classes, and without any balance changes to account for this, something that the original game also needed, the game is pretty unengaging towards the end. While it might be a good starting point for new players of the game, I simply cannot recommend it for $50. Wait until it's on sale or just legally obtain the game if you are simply so excited to play you cannot wait. Now for me, I will be playing the International Zodiac Job System version of the game. It's pretty close to the original PS2 version, but it's substantially better in a lot of ways. Updating the HUD, updating the way license boards progress, adding balance changes to jobs and items, changing missed attacks from using MP to having their own bars like in other FF games, and a lot more. So the story is a political drama about these two nations, Damascus and Arcadia who have been locked in war for years. Finally, Arcadia comes knocking at Damascus' doorstep on the prince's wedding day. Uh-oh, I sense this becoming plot relevant within the next five minutes of cutscenes. So the prince leads the charge in the fight to push Arcadia back, but uh-oh, his armor was designed by a child and he has a giant fucking hole exposing his chest. Wouldn't you know it, he gets shot in the chest by some random fucking guy and dies on the spot. Bing bang blam, you're now thrust into gameplay as a soldier called Rex, and you meet the guy you saw swoop up the dead prince's body, Captain Bosch. This is a place that you're introduced to combat in its most basic form. Taking the action menu based MMO style combat from Final Fantasy XI and adapting it to a traditional single player Final Fantasy game. This is achieved by making the menus much closer to previous entries and adding a pause every time you open the menu to give players the time they need to make decisions. Targeting individual enemies and waiting for them to die can sometimes be the name of the game, especially in this tutorial, which is where the speed function really comes in handy. Overall, the sequence very adequately introduces the player to somewhat unorthodox combat for Final Fantasy. You get through the castle to protect the king, but oh no, everyone and the king is dead, and soon you are too at the hands of Captain Bosch. The king intended all along to sell Damascus to the Empire. His majesty was a traitor. Captain, I... Now the game starts full and proper, with you playing as Rex's brother, Vaughn, a street thief who slowly gets wrapped up in the war, first in relation to a sky pirate and his, uh... Girlfriend. She isn't as bad as it looks, and is very vital to the progression of the story and explanation of lore in the game. Just because she looks like something out of a fantasy Playboy magazine doesn't mean she's just a sexy lamp. 
Then Vaughn gets involved with the resistance movement against the Arcadian rule, and it spirals out of control from there, slowly gaining more party members. First amongst them, and the only party member that is present throughout the entire game if you don't count the intro sequence, is the aforementioned Vaughn. Vaughn is pretty annoying and not super plot relevant, except for being the catalyst for some story and lore exposition, so not really a great choice for, like, the Cloud Strife or Noctis of this game. He's not a bad character in concept, he's just bogged down with the combination of questionable dubbing, writing, and annoying attitudes that persists any time he has dialogue. I brought you some of those flowers you like. Galbana lilies. Remember? You always said how they smelled nice, and how pretty they were. Remember? The king. Did you? Were you really a part of it? I believe you. Not me, then. Believe in your brother. He was a fine soldier. He fought to the last to protect his homeland. No. Surely he fought to protect his brother. You don't know anything! This actually extends into gameplay with him having a lower base health and lower MP stat than pretty much all of the other characters, leading him to be reserved for throwaway classes like the Knight, Technic, Thief, or Archer. The second character we are introduced to is Pinello, a fellow orphan child roaming the streets of Rabinaster, the capital of Damasca. She's not really plot relevant at all, which is reflected in her being gone for over a quarter of the entire game. A lot of the time she's just kind of there, and for the period of time that she's gone, she only really serves as a device for Vaughn to still be following these random political figures, resistant members, and pirates. Next is Balthier, your resident sky pirate. Balthier is my favorite character in the entire game, despite having some kind of gross moments. What's wrong with her? I always knew Fran didn't take well to being tied up. I just never knew how much. How about you? Gross. That's so gross. Uh oh, Balthier. You can't say that. That's gross. Balthier is such a big pillar to the story just by having the two character traits of being confident and being grounded. There's always just enough time for character drama, which is honestly just as bad or as good as any other JRPG, but as soon as Balthier is introduced to any squabble, he's only there to shut it down. This arguably makes Balthier the most likable character in the game, and it certainly doesn't hurt that his voice actor arguably did the best job in the entire game. Fran is your second Sky Pirate and Balthier's companion, and while her design is a little more than on the nose, she works really well writing-wise. Her bouncing off of Balthier and really the rest of the squad often makes for some of the best dialogue moments in the game and actually manages to make exposition somewhat interesting, although it is kind of obvious when they're shoving it down her throat. Fran also introduces the concept of normality in the world of whatever it's called in this entry. RPGs often have a problem where they introduce a world so strange and alien or important concepts that the player would have no way of knowing that they have no choice but to explain it to you through dialogue. FF12 kind of fixes this by making the overall world much more grounded, and when foreign concepts are introduced, they're usually introduced as foreign to some of the characters who have lived more normal lives, so it makes sense to be explaining royal legends or something to them. One of the first places you are shown this happening is when Vaughn meets Balthier and Fran. Not many Vieira where you come from, thief. And then they just move on. You've already been introduced to pig and alligator people, so it isn't like a weird stretch to have Fran there. You eventually get the traitor king killer, Bosch, to join your party, but what? He didn't kill the king? It's kind of a weird fake out for his twin to kill the king instead while dressed up as Bosch, but I think it's really well done in execution. In the scene where Bosch says, His Majesty was a traitor. You can audibly hear the difference in his voice. It's really subtle and easy to miss. I know I did the first time I played the game, but I like it. It kind of works. But other than that, Bosch kind of just stands around and is serious and gruff all the time. It kind of fits with his character of being this battle-hardened war veteran and protector of the Dalmasca royalty, but it never makes him super interesting, even though he is one of the most important characters to the plot of the story. It's to the point where side characters that get less than four hours of screen time, like Vossler, are more interesting and better representations of the character Bosch is trying to be. 
Fossler is the guest party member that stays around for a decent chunk of the game. He later betrays the party and turns them into the Arcadian forces. He didn't do it because he's a bad guy, he did it because he wanted the best for Dalmasca, the only place he ever called home. He saw the Resistance movie that your party is in as a genuine threat to Dalmasca and wanted to stop you for the better of his homeland. But despite this level of depth from a character who on the surface is very similar to Bosch, Bosch never really seems to get the same level of depth, something that even a character as two-dimensional as Vaughn gets the luxury of having. Last of the party members is Princess Ash, the person that the now-dead prince married. In the intro cutscene it is said that she killed herself, but then not even an hour and a half later, you see her multiple times, and then she joins your party as a guest character other than the name Amalia. And then, later when you're on the Dreadnought, it is revealed she was Princess Ash all along, and that she didn't kill herself, and that her uncle just said it to keep her safe. Number one, this is the first time in the game a shock like this isn't mutually shared between the player and the rest of the characters, because you probably already watched the seven minutes of intro cutscenes before even starting to play the game. Secondly, the fact that the uncle used the alleged suicide of his niece, who is literally the princess of Damasca and was next in line to take the throne, is never explored, despite the fact that the story repeatedly hints that that was the uncle's intention. Sure, he used his place and power to then aid the resistance behind closed doors, but it was never directly stated that was his original intention. And for a story that follows a political drama, it's a pretty questionable choice to completely omit that from the writing. However, Ash as a character is pretty well written. She's brash and headstrong, but given her position it makes sense, and she shows actual development throughout the story into a more level-headed person. She's kind of a bland character, especially when she has nothing to do, but overall she's fine. It also doesn't hurt that gameplay-wise, she is probably one of the more useful characters, with a relatively high starting HP and a very high starting MP, probably making her the statistically best red mage. The villains in the game are also surprisingly compelling for being, at their base, the bad guy faction. First of all, Arcadia has the coolest designs for almost everything in the game. Even the basic foot soldiers have a sort of stormtrooper vibe, which is a design feel I've always loved. And from looks alone, they're pretty imposing, harkening back to the classic Black Knights. However, it's the higher-ups that really stand out in design. The Senate definitely looks like generic cancel of the old people and are kind of lackluster, but compare that to the other old Arcadian, the Emperor, and it's a night and day difference. His design not only really fits within the world of the game, but also strikes a perfect balance of decoration and regalty while fitting within his character. Vane, the main bad guy for the game, again looks very regal, while still having the air of business-like professionalism, something that fits very well within to his character. This design also extends to all of the judges in the game. Gabranth looks just as imposing and loyal as the other judges, but ultimately he's more like a basic foot soldier than a judge, reflecting his nature of questioning his position and allegiance in the hierarchy of ranks. All of this is given and communicated through very little screen time for these characters, especially compared to the character development the rest of the main characters get throughout the game. However, while the characters are generally well written, it's unnecessarily difficult to end up really connecting with most of them. Vaughn is generally unlikable despite having all of the prerequisites for a lovable goofball archetype. Pinello gets so little dialogue throughout the entire game that it's questionable why she's even there. Bosch is just way too serious to even take him seriously most of the time. I must treat you as I would Ondor, as I would treat any of better of the Empire. Then what will you do? Hold me here in chains? <laughs> Something. Ash's major character development only happens in the latter quarter of the game. Fran's backstory is also only told in the latter quarter of the game, and it is neither significant enough to matter to the story in any way, nor is the section of the game where Fran's past is revealed any fun. It's here where the game really starts to drag, relying too much on backtracking, long walks, enemies that drain your resources, or anything they can do to pad the length of the game out. Once you get the magical MacGuffin of the game, the Dawn Shard, the game just grinds to a halt. Ash spent all of this time trying to get the Dawn Shard, but it turns out she doesn't know how to use it. Have fun spending the next 40 minutes of your life walking to one village so that the village elder can tell you that he can't help you. 
But what's this? Larsa shows up and says we have to go all the way to a very old man on the top of a mountain. Have fun walking there for another half an hour. And then when you get to the old man, he says that you have to go through the shittiest dungeon in the entire game to get some other magical bullshit so you can stop Vayne from going to war or something. And bottom line, you should have taken the fight to Arcadia once you got the Dawn Shard. It doesn't make any sense for Ash. The person who was the most adamant about getting the Dawn Shard once she knew that's what they had to do, to not know how to use it. If the Dawn Shard is nearly as important to the royal family as the story makes it out to be, there should be almost no reason for Ash to not be able to use it in any way. It destroys the entire pace of the game. And it's not like the quality of pacing dwindles over time as most long-form JRPGs tend to do. The game's pacing was completely fine up until you got the Dawn Shard and went back to Bujerba. And then just like that, bam, the game slows to a crawl. Alright, so if the game gets not good, what's the point of playing it? First, I think the game has a very interesting visual style. It looks like a mashup of Final Fantasy X's and Tactics art styles. I think that the art style was made around the mostly desert setting in the game, and I think it works. It especially makes the other areas in the game that aren't desert or grass flatlandy kind of areas much more interesting visually and cause them to stand out more. And just like any other Final Fantasy game, Hisoshi Sakamoto and Nobu Uematsu go absolutely crazy on the soundtrack. This is probably one of my favorite video game soundtracks. It's much more whimsical than the other Final Fantasy games, especially the ones with a plot that is more centered around telling a more mature story, but it can also be very big and bombastic in the moments it needs to be while carrying the drama of the situations. However, I wish there were more toned down tracks, like the dream to be a sky pirate. This is why Final Fantasy VII's soundtrack is still my favorite out of the whole series. It captures moments of quiet so well while still having crazy dramatic pieces for crazy dramatic events, especially in the third disc. But I still think this game probably places at number two, and it has some of the most beautiful renditions of the classic Final Fantasy songs out of the entire series. Combat is also some of the best in any RPG. The basic combat system is like a well-oiled machine. Everything flows together extremely well, especially with the Gambit system. Due to how combat is handled, the game would get kind of out of hand if you had to manually control all of your teammates moves through the menu, so FF12 introduced the Gambit system. The Gambit system allows you to program in the priorities, moves, priorities for those moves, when to do those moves, what to do those moves against, etc. It's a system that allows for a lot of depth and while having some glaring limitations mostly related to not being able to do the equivalent of an else or else if statement, it works surprisingly well and I never had any AI issues throughout the entire game. You also can't just immediately create an extremely complex automated process right from the start. You have to earn it. First, you have to have the gambits and the moves you want to bind to the character, both of which you have to buy or find in the case of some spells. You also have to earn additional slots for the gambits through the license board. 
The license board is like the skill tree in the game, except it's all on a checkered board. To unlock these tiles, you have to use a resource called LP, which you get from killing enemies alongside XP. Each license board is different, both between characters and between jobs and classes. The license board might be my favorite part of the game, as there aren't any individual requirements for levels and strength, magic, or whatever. It's all in just one grid. However, there are some shortcomings with the board. Late game, the upgrades get more and more expensive, but it never really feels like the amount of LP scales correctly. Sure, it's not a bad thing for the time between level ups to get longer and longer as the game goes on, but when you feel a lack of resources even on characters that have a specific item that increases LP gain, I feel like there's a bit of a problem. Classes, or in Final Fantasy jobs, are fun to play with and I think are interesting, but are also unbalanced and pretty poorly thought out. The mages are all very good classes with interesting progression, however due to the base stats characters start out with, it is really only advisable to play a mage on one or two characters, maybe three. This means the other three or four characters are stuck playing melee classes, leading to some repetition unless you again want to inhibit your party. I have a feeling this is part of the reason why Zodiac Age made it so you could have two classes after unlocking Belial on the license board, but overall having two classes per character just makes them too powerful to be engaging in the slightest, something that Final Fantasy XII base game was already struggling with. Look, Final Fantasy XII is such a good game at its core, and for as much criticism as I have given most aspects of the game, I genuinely think it is the best JRPG ever made. And I wouldn't be talking about it if I really thought the game was bad or didn't like it. I straight up don't have the patience to play a game that I don't like, let alone make an entire 20 minute video on it. I just think this game has a lot of really big flaws that are really hard for me to overlook, especially when talking about it for this long. I wish that Zodiac Age did more to improve on the game, or even was just a full on remake, because there is so much potential in this game that is just destroyed and gutted in the effort to make this game longer. I hope that someday, probably in 2043 or something, We'll get a full-on remake in the same vein as Final Fantasy VII Remake. And when they do remake it, I hope that they fix all of the bullshit in this game. I mean, all of it. Just right, right, whoop, right out the window. I feel like every video ends like this. Yeah, it's because they do. Oh. Well, what did you think of the game, Todd? Okay.